Good morning and wake, welcome to the Mesa City Council study session for April 21st. I uh, would like to excuse Councilmember Luna and Finter. The Can first item. That, uh, heart excuse for being here? Uh, I don't know if Finter's pulling that one, but Luna is still uh, comfortably within the heart surgery excuse uh, time period. So we wish him well as we do Councilmember Finter. Uh, first item on our agenda is to hear a presentation and provide direction on proposed utility related capital improvement projects, utility rates, and departmental budgets for environmental management and sustainability, energy, resources, and water resources. I think that uses all the time that we had allocated for this presentation. <laughs> um, thank you for being here, Candace, uh, Beth, Scott, Frank, and Dan. Okay, and actually it'll be uh, Seth Well instead of Dan. For oh, this I'm morning. sorry. But um, Seth, so we do have we do have quite a group here, and, and Seth will be joining me here in a minute um, as we play musical chairs as we rotate everybody through this morning. Um, but as you said, uh, Mayor, this morning we do want to come and speak to you about utility rates, but also what everything that goes into the utility rates. Those would be the capital improvement projects related to utility programs, as well as their operational departments. So kind of a budget highlight, budget overview for those different departments. So as you said, we do have multiple people up here who are going to speak. We'll, we'll kind of go through and transition this. We'll try to be as seamless as possible. Um, we'll be going through the different areas, so we'll talk about CIP first, kind of an overview of the CIP projects that Beth will be providing. And then we'll go into the various departments in those areas. We'll be able to take questions throughout. Um, so if you have questions on a particular department or a particular rate, um, we'd encourage you to ask those questions as we go over those. And then we'll kind of sum it up at the end and say, what does this really mean for the Enterprise Fund um, and for the average homeowner impact for our utility rate presentation or recommendations. Um, so with that, we'll start with uh, Beth. I'm sorry, go over real quick. You're gonna do I do, I do have a couple. Because we are focused on the utility rates, um, and this is very financial in our um, overview, we do wanna mention though that the utility departments do support the council priorities that have been identified so far, even though they were not necessarily included in those presentations, excuse me, those presentations. One of them is the economic sustainability that we've already had a presentation on. And part of that is our various plants that you'll hear about today through the capital improvement program, the new uh, Signal Butte water treatment facility and the expansion of the Greenfield water reclamation plant are both um, impacting and supporting economic development and sustainability in that particular area of the city. As well as in our environmental management and sustainability department, our solid waste program for our rollout program supports the um, transforming neighborhoods that will be a presentation that will be upcoming a little bit later this month. So while they're not included in those particular presentations on those priorities, we do want to let you know that the utility departments are supporting the priorities that have been identified by council at this point. I do want to remind you that as an enterprise fund, the enterprise fund is managed as one full fund, similar to the general fund. There are many different moving parts within the enterprise fund. The enterprise fund has the same financial policies of trying to maintain a minimum of 8 to 10 percent reserve fund balance. So when we're looking at the financials and the impacts, the economic, or excuse me, the expenditure pressures and trying to set the rates accordingly, that is the goal that we're, that we're moving toward or trying to keep, which is that 8 to 10 percent over the forecast periods, not just one fiscal year, but multiple fiscal years. Um, we also smooth rates. So one of the things that we do here in the city of Mesa is we try not to have any particular year that would have a large spike um, in, in any of the rates for our customers. And so we look out over a three to five year time period and make sure we're smoothing and have the appropriate resources at the appropriate time. So as promised on April 7th, I'm back. And uh, this time I'm with the Enterprise Bond Program. So in 2014, we went out to, for an election, as you know, and we were again... Uh, blessed by the voters uh, with an approval of a, of a nice bond package to continue to um, support our utilities. Um, these are the monies that were approved for the four areas, water, wastewater, gas, and electric, and the um, categories that the money was put into when we went out to the public. If we start with water, there's actually 59 projects and two contracts that were envisioned as part of the $315 million, $315.7 million that we were approved for water projects. And there's a lot of different projects in here, but the thing to note about, about the water and utilities programs in general is you have to apply Pareto's principle to them, 80% of the cost or in 20% of the line items. And that's very true when we look at the utility bond program. Um, 
initially, if you start and you just look, there are five major projects that that put together with the contract for Val Vista and the city of Phoenix make up over two thirds of the bond project. Three of those projects are in Southeast Mesa for water supply, the, the uh, new treatment plant, which will be built at Signal Butte and Elliott that we want to have making water by May of 18 is a large portion of the money for the project. The, C the raw water line bringing water over from the CAP canal to the plant for treatment. The Elliott Road water line, we have a 42 inch transmission main that will be going down Elliott Road to distribute water out of the plant. And then the other two projects are kind of north and west, um, Mesa four and five, those are the two Val Vista <laughs> transmission main projects. Phase two was just completed, phase three is under construction. That's part of our contractual obligations to the city of Phoenix. So many of our projects in the water side are tied up in these five big projects and the contracts with the city of Phoenix. Moving on into wastewater, we have uh, 36 projects and a contract involved in 178.2 million. And again, we see on the wastewater bond projects, there is one project that takes up over 70% of this money, and that is the expansion of the Greenfield Water Reclamation Plant that we share in partnership with the town of Queen Creek and the town of Gilbert. Our share of that plant is uh, taking up over about 70% of our bond program. Um, we are now just starting the design concepts and the, our partners are working with their councils to identify funding and get the contracts in place to expand the plant. We do look for construction to start in the first quarter of 2018. Moving on into electric and gas. And electric and gas, it's, again, it's kind of important to understand the nature of these programs. Um, Frank's programs in electric and gas are driven by others in many ways, and I'm going to talk about that. But we had a $27 million approved in electric bonds, as you kind of see there. And in natural gas bonds, we had just about $59 million approved in bond programs, and those were the areas that were identified when we went out to the voters. The thing to note about the electric and gas prog projects is many of their schedules are driven by others. Gas and electric are under the streets, and gas is joint trenched with water in Mesa. So if we are going to go in and replace the older water lines for uh, water resources, we replace the gas lines at the same time in the area if they're of an age and, and uh, condition that need to be replaced. That represents about 23% of the program just in that alone. And then if we are redoing a street, say Mesa Drive or any of our older streets in the city, we don't want to go in and trench the street up a year later or two years later. We really want that pavement to stay for a solid five years before it starts getting cut up. So we, we do replace the gas and electric at that time or underground if we need to. The other part of Frank's program that is kind of beyond a schedule are the customer demand and new customers. Uh, about 35% of his program is tied up in new customer services for gas and electric. So much of his program goes into those systems. And that's about it. Great, thank you. That's, that's it. <laughs> Council, uh, questions related to this, this much of the presentation? Like we haven't gotten into proposed rate increases yet. That's that's gonna correct. that's coming up. Is that's that right? Coming up. Okay, thank you. This is just correct. This is just an overview of the capital improvement program um, for utilities because it does relate to the rates and the fact that it results in debt service on the bonds that we issue for those projects, and then those debt service are in our forecast, which uh, comes into our rate recommendations. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna leave and let Seth well come with you. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> And so speaking of that, as we go through this then, uh, we take a look, we, we came and talked to you about our general fund forecast and kind of walked through all the different moving parts that are in that forecast and how we go about that. It's a very similar process with the enterprise fund. So when we look at the enterprise fund, we're looking at the expenditure pressures, things that are gonna happen, whether we're gonna have new contracts, um, new costs, those types of things, as well as the revenues revenue side, which is number of accounts, amount of consumption. Each of the departments or each of the utilities is different. Uh, we look at them individually. They're done as a business within themselves, and then they're part of the overall enterprise fund. So when we look at the enterprise fund and we look at what our needs are for 1617, these are the revenue estimates that we feel are needed for 1617 in order to cover the costs that have been identified through the forecast uh, process. There are different ways that we can go about. Again, this is, these are, we start with revenue targets, 
How we go about to manage those targets over the next year depends on the individual enterprise or the individual utility, whether we're going to do it through flat rates, whether we're going to do it through percentages, and then therefore the impact on those particular customers may vary based on each utility. And so we'll show you that we have different approaches for the different utilities as we go into 16, 17. And we're going to start off with environmental management and sustainability, and Scott Boucher is going to go over that section. Good morning, Mayor Council. Um, just to start off with some of the fiscal year 15, 16 accomplishments um, for environmental management and sustainability. Um, we are still um, in the process of converting our fleet to CNG from diesel. Um, we currently have 21 of the 70 um, solid waste vehicles are CNG, and we anticipate by the end of next fiscal year, we'll actually have 46 of those vehicles will be CNG. Um, the, the Clean Sweep Green Sweep program continues to be a very successful program, very popular program. Uh, as Candace was mentioning, um, we work with um, community services and police department, code compliance, uh, in addition to our residents with that program, and we're also working with the Transforming Neighborhoods group. Um, and they'll be back um, in the next week or two to, to talk to you in regards to uh, how Clean Sweep Green Sweep works in that, that program. Um, we're also converting our Fleet Mind. Uh, which is a routing and operational tracking database. Um, it's really going to help us automate a lot of the manual systems that we have now, a lot of stuff that we're writing and then having to transfer from paper. Um, it's going to automate that for us, and I think it's going to help us get a lot of efficiencies in the department. Um, in addition, we've actually fully implemented our regional landfill contracts. That began January 1st. Um, so now we have six different vendors in 11 locations that we can bring our trash and recycle to. Um, which is helping us with efficiencies, trucks not having to drive as far, um, and also helping us out with the uh, landfill prices that we're seeing. So um, we are working with um, energy resources and water resources to try and increase the city's solar portfolio. Um, we've you know, been working with them over the last year and hope to come to council in the next um, month or so, a couple of months, um, with proposals on uh, additional solar projects within the city, both in the downtown area and within the water department. Um, so we'll be coming back with that. We've been working with them over the last year. And then if you haven't been by lately, um, I'd really encourage folks to go to the Urban Garden uh, right there on First Avenue in downtown Mesa, it, along with the placemaking goals of, of the council. It really is um, coming into its own. The trees are maturing. Um, you know, the garden looks beautiful right now, and it, it's really a great place to go to, and you can hang out either, you know, at, at lunchtime or they've got a lot of events even going on there in the weekends. And so uh, really would like to... Um, give credit to the Mesa Urban Garden Group who, um, you know, the Department of Environmental Management and Sustainability helped them through the process of getting that established, but um, they really have taken that and made it a beautiful place in downtown Mesa. So I uh, just wanted to give kudos to the Urban Garden Group on that. Um, things that are coming up in 1617, uh, because of continued growth in the eastern parts of Mesa, we are looking at doing a boundary change because um, right now we're getting out of balance where we have more trucks going out on certain days to cover the, the demand in eastern part of Mesa than what we have in the central and, and western parts of Mesa. So we're looking at trying to balance that out, and that helps save us so that we don't have to buy additional vehicles, solid waste vehicles. And we're looking at doing that sometime in October of this year. Um, so we're just getting started on that process. Um, also, with the purchase of the CNG vehicles and converting the fleet, uh, we need to have a permanent CNG station. Right now we're using a temporary station. Um, we're working with engineering, and we anticipate that that will be done this summer, that that permanent station will be installed. Um, and we're exploring options. I talked about the regional contracts for the landfill. We're having some preliminary conversations with um, some of the valley cities in regards to a regional contracts for recycling. So we're looking also for summertime, possibly releasing a bid for uh, some regional recycling contracts and hoping we can get some of those economies of scale that we're seeing from the landfill contracts on our recycling contracts. Uh, some of the budget highlights for 16, 17, we are seeing significant savings from the, the CNG. You can see in 14, fiscal year 14, 15, it was over $300,000 worth of savings in comparison to what we would have paid for diesel. And uh, in 15, 16, we're almost there now, and that's through nine months. So that's through March 31st of this year. Um, clean sweep, green sweep program, we are going to be, we'll get into the rate recommendations, but we are um, recommending an increase on the clean sweep, green sweep fee um, to help us expand to that program. 
both for the residents and then for those city departments that we're working with that I mentioned earlier. Um, we, the boundary change um, is $75,000. Most of that money goes to public outreach so that residents are aware that this is happening um, and that they're aware ahead of time because when you're changing somebody's, somebody's day that they're getting either their recycling or their trash service, you need to make sure that they're aware of that. Um, regional contracts, we are seeing savings from that. Um, and this savings that you see as far as $30,000 annually, that's just because we're able to take our um, tonnage and combine those together and it's kind of a tiered rate structure, so to speak, and the more tonnage that we bring to certain facilities, the, we get a discounted rate on that, so we are seeing some savings. That's in addition to what we believe we got lower rates just from the beginning by combining those with other municipalities. Um, we are seeing some pressures from recycling with the markets being down that we're just seeing less revenue that's coming in from recycling. Uh, but we are concentrating on trying to get that recycling stream in the blue barrel as clean as we can um, because that helps us out with, with what we receive as far as um, money from the sale of those recyclables. Um, as we get into the utility rate recommendations, we are recommending a $0.10 cent increase to the Mesa Green and Clean, green and clean Fee. Um, that would be $0.06 cents that covers the household hazardous waste events and then $0.04 cents for the uh, clean sweep, green sweep program. Uh, that would take it from 74 cents to 84 cents. Um, the average residential customer increase would be a dollar. Oh, wait, am I on the wrong one here? You skipped one, but that's okay. Oh, Finish I'm sorry. this one and we'll go back to that. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, here, I can go back. Go back to it. I apologize. So we are recommending a 4% increase for all the residential rates. So that would take your 90 gallon, which is the typical. Um, barrel that most of our residents have from uh, it would go up a dollar seven per month so to, from 2672 to 2779 uh, the 60 gallon gallon barrel would go up 95 cents additional black barrel so if you have a second or third black barrel that would go up 50 cents and the residential green barrel we keep at half the price of the black barrel so that would go up 25 cents to six dollars and 56 cents now I went over this one I apologize for having skipped that um, Clean and green at 10 cents. So the average residential customer who would have your typical 90 gallon black and blue barrel with the clean and green fee, it would be $1.17 a month is what they would see as far as an increase. Uh, we're also recommending a 4% increase on the bulk item and appliance collection. Um, so those would go from the bulk item is $20.99 currently. And that's a scheduled service that you can call um, and we will come out and pick up bulk items for you. Uh, that would go from $20.99 to $21.83. And then appliance pickup would go uh, from $17.31 to $18. Um, we also are looking at establishing or recommending establishing. I think Mr. Richards has a question. Just a quick for question. I, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand what the fourth bullet they're establishing a new bulk item and appliance collection for non city of Mesa refuse customers. Okay. Is that commercial? That is commercial customers that are not City of Mesa solid waste customers. Okay. The idea with this is, is some of the folks that most utilize it is the apartment complexes that utilize that bulk waste pickup. Um, so with the, the Senate bill that passed and now going to state law July 1st that the apartment complexes are open for commercial competition, what we wanted to do is establish a rate for a, a service that we know there's a demand for, but it is... Um, have it line up with what we, our goals are on the commercial side for having our profit margins that we, we bring in. So essentially, it's if you're not a City of Mesa solid waste customer, but you want that service, but you're still located within the City of Mesa, so that would be our commercial customers. Mm -hmm. We're able to provide that service for you. It's just it's going to cost you a little bit more than it would if you were a City of Mesa solid waste customer. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Okay. That's great. Thanks. Uh, and that would be both for the bulk and the appliance pickup. Um, our commercial front load, front load rates, we are not recommending any increases on that. I've been here a couple of times to talk about commercial and where we're at with the apartment complexes. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those. Um, but otherwise, we're also asking for a 4.9% increase on our commercial roll-off rates. Um, we haven't had a roll-off rate increase in, in, in a long time. Um, and to be honest, right now, the, the demand for our commercial roll-off service is exceeding what we're able to um, service. We're, we're telling folks that they have to wait uh, for that service many times. So um, we're increasing that rate a little bit with 4.9% because we haven't had a rate increase in a while. And when we looked at what others are, are charging, uh, we're pretty low on that rate. So we're hoping 
uh, with this rate increase, we'll, we'll still continue to have demand, but um, maybe it'll be a, a little bit less demand that we'll, and we'll be able to meet, but we'll be able to make more off of that, so. And with that, that's the end of environmental management and sustainability, if there's any questions at all. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Thompson. I, I asked in audit and finance, and just so that everybody hears, these rate increases are keeping your department whole, correct? Um, so it's not like we're making this big, giant nest egg of, of dollars, but this is really to keep up with what it's costing you um, to, to get the job done. That is, that is correct, yeah. Um, especially on the on the residential side, because we do run the two different businesses, so to speak, with with solid waste. But on the residential side, it's just for us to be able to meet um, what our requirements are of what our expenditures are. I have a couple of questions. Can you remind me what, what's the economics of the of the recycle program? I know I, we have contracts with various providers, mm -hmm. and do we make money on recycling, or is it a break even proposition, or do we lose money? Uh, I mean, it depends. We have, we have several different contracts. Um, what some of the recycling companies are going to, because the commodity prices have, have decreased significantly over the years, um, some of the recycling contracts are now going with where they charge us a processing fee in order to process the recycling. And then depending, we, they'll do audits of our recycling. And the, depending upon the amount of contamination that we have, they treat that percentage like it would be trash. So, for example, if it's a 10% contamination rate, they, if we bring them 10 tons, one ton of that they consider to be trash, and we have to pay for that. Um, but what we do save, and then by the time we're done, they, they, when we have that sort of um, contract, we are then, whatever they sell those commodities for, we share in the, the revenue generated from selling the recyclables. Where the recycling really comes in, though, is we, we don't have to pay for the disposal rates. So you're, you're going to make a little bit of money. We're making less money off of the recycling, but you are saving money because you're not paying those landfill tipping fees. Um, so it, there's, there's a combination that goes in there. You're saving because you're not putting it into the landfill and having to put it, um, pay for that, but also you're making some money. Um, but to be honest, we're making less of that just because of what's happened with the commodity prices worldwide. Okay. But it is still is a, a net uh, increase? Yes. Uh, okay. In round, is it more or less a break-even deal, or do we, I mean, I, I get the cost savings of not paying landfill fees. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I guess it depends on the commodity and just to, and those prices fluctuate. And, and that's those prices the, fluctuate, and it depends on which contract and where we bring them to. So when I said we had those six vendors in 11 different locations, we have different contracts. Some pay us more for the commodities, and some pay us less. What we look at is the travel time associated with it, what we call deadhead time for the, for the truck and how far it has to drive and kind of take that into consideration. So how much is it going to cost us to drive to the location that's going to pay us a little bit more? Are we going to spend more money driving there than what we're going to make from the increase in that commodity price? And so we have folks that, that that's what they're doing is they're looking at those contracts, looking at our routes and trying to... Um, route them in the most efficient manner. But yes, the recycling does does make us money. Okay. Uh, I appreciated your comment about the ur urban garden. I'm a, a big fan as well. And I'm just wondering about the potential of expanding urban garden to becoming <coughs> urban gardens. I mean, there's a lot of, I think, plots of land. We're a big city, mm -hmm. and it's nice we have an urban garden, but I think we could do a whole lot more than have one urban garden. Yeah, there, there are... Um, a couple others that are not city owned. I believe there's one in, um, is it the Escobedo neighborhood or Washington? Washington I know some Park church groups have them. And yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we could always look at what else we could do. Um, I, I will tell you that the, 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 the urban garden group really um, kudos out to them because mm -hmm. they are the ones, once, once that was built, the city departments, I have to give them credit. They, they came together and really helped us out, whether it was, you know, the, the enterprise funds or parks and um, others that, that helped with that development. But really, the Mesa Urban Garden Group now runs that 
that garden and um, has done a fantastic job. And that's one of the things I learned. I'll give credit to Donna DeFrancesco, who works for me. She taught me that we, we have to get the residents involved and you have to get a group that's going to be passionate about running it because that's where the difficult part becomes is, mm -hmm. isn't actually in the operation of it and making sure that it's maintained and making sure there's there's many urban gardens that I've seen across the country that they they flourish for a little while but then they decline because you don't have that those residents that are passionate about maintaining it um, and so we really are blessed with the group that we have here in downtown Mesa that has been able to make sure I mean they have events that are happening there pretty consistently and uh, it's just a beautiful place to go to too that makes a lot of sense to me I we, like I don't think the city can come to a neighborhood and say hey we're we're gonna have a, we're gonna start an urban garden in your neighborhood it has to be the neighborhood that wants it right yeah. so we'll look for opportunities to do that out of curiosity do we have a we have a mulch program of sorts don't we I mean, I know we have blue barrels and green barrels, but is there another? There's another barrel uh, potential out there for the a mulch program. Well, we we have the green barrel program, and and most of that does um, go becomes mulch, um, but it's a third party that handles that for us. We don't do composting in house. Composting. I'm um, sorry, that's the word. I was yeah, that's for. one of the things we are we are looking at. That's that's on my um, wish list of things to look at um, going forward. Uh, I actually was at a conference just a couple weeks ago in San Diego, um, touring a couple of different compost facilities out there. Uh, it was part of BioCycle, and we're actually working with ASU and um, the School of Sustainability right now on a regional approach to green organics. Um, but we'll probably have some, some more solid information from ASU uh, late summer, I'd say maybe early fall, that we'll have more information on that. And I really would hope to come back to council at some point and, and discuss composting and what we'd be looking at doing with our program. Okay, paper, great. Paper. <clears throat> I, I was impressed with the, this, the cost savings in CNG versus diesel. Mm -hmm. And that's true even this last year where, where oil prices have been so low. I'm, and, I'm, I'm just surprised that, that CNG is still a, a, a cheaper alternative given the dramatic decrease in gasoline prices. And my, my neighbor here could probably answer better than I, but we've also seen a decrease in, in natural gas prices at the same time. Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, the, uh, Frank McRae with the Energy Resource Department. Um, we have seen a commensurate decrease in natural gas prices as diesel has fallen, as petro petroleum products has fallen as well. They're at pretty much historical lows uh, this past winter. They're starting to creep up a little bit. They're just about almost at $2 per million BTU now, but uh, uh, when diesel hit a low point, natural gas did well. A lot of that's due to the, the domestic production of petroleum and natural gas. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, I guess you have more more to your presentation, Candace. Is we that have right? More. That was okay. just one area. So we have two more areas well, just, to cover. I was going to have a follow up question. What's the schedule for replacing the other? What is it? Forty something odd trucks. Um, we will be. Let me go back. I have it written down. Guessing some of the older ones are starting to life cycle off anyway. Yeah. So the way that our our um, replacement schedule lines out right now, all of the side loading trucks, so the ones that do the barrel service will re be replaced by fiscal year 1819. Um, and then the roll-offs and the front load trucks have a longer life cycle to them, so it'll be a little bit longer, but it looks like by fiscal year 21-22, the entire fleet would be CNG. So you. we're still following our typical replacement schedule right. with those trucks. But um, all of the ASLs, as I said, by 1819, and then the rest of it by 21-22. Excellent. Thank you. All right, our next area is Energy Resources Department with Frank McRae, his director will go over that area. Good morning again. Uh, Frank McRae with the Energy Resources Department. Also in the um, uh, audience is Richard Manzo, our CAP Administrator, William Norton, our Gas Utility Deputy Director, Marty Hunter, our Electric Utility Deputy Director, and John Petroff, our Senior Fiscal Analyst. So you'll hear me mention safety, reliability, and efficiency. That really um, how we provide our gas and electric utility services, decision-making priorities, uh, what we focus on in terms of training, et cetera, really focuses on those three goals, um, and it's, it's our priority. So in terms of safety on the electric side, we've gone about two and a half years now without a lost time accident. That's really a tribute to the personnel that we have, the training that our supervisors have uh, provided our employees and uh, introducing new work work uh, practices, etc. So um, 
we, uh, we're really proud of that uh, streak of two and a half years. That's uh, not a common uh, occurrence or an experience in the electric utility um, world. In terms of reliability, um, as we've converted our system from 4KV to 12K, we, we've made a lot of investments in strengthening, making our system more robust. We still do experience some damages from storms. The storms last uh, August and September, we did have one pole get damaged, but compared to what we might have experienced historically, that was a pretty good, uh, pretty good experience for us. Um, in terms of our responding to those emergencies, our average response time uh, uh, fiscal year to date is about 22 minutes. And so we are really um, responding well and in a timely manner to those types of calls from our customers. One of the other things that we're doing to enhance our reliability is we're putting what's called trip savers, which is a automatic circuit recloser, which allows the circuit when it's impacted by say a bird or a rodent or a tree limb, it trips the circuit, it senses uh, again that it can reclose and if it recloses and there's no continuous fault on the circuit, then the circuit's restored and the customer only experiences a momentary outages. Currently, if we don't have some device like that on our circuits, then the circuit breaker or the, or the fuse will blow and we'll have to send a truck out there to identify the nature of the cause, patrol the circuit, replace the fuse, and bring the circuit back on. So these trip savers should save quite a bit of money as well as the trips. Um, also to focus on some growth areas, uh, we, we've had some uh, growth arise, uh, which is a good experience for us. Um, would like to point out that Encore 2, um, they're also a participant in our solar program, so we're, uh, we're pleased with uh, the developments at Encore and uh, their participation in the solar program. Uh, Going on to the next slide, so uh, in 1617, our emphasis will again be on uh, investing our time, energy, and financial resources into safety, reliability, and efficiency enhancements. Uh, hopefully this time next year, we'll be talking about uh, three and a half years without a lost time accident. Um, we've really started investing a lot of uh, time and energy into the inspection and testing and replacement programs for the various pieces of infrastructure that you see there. Um, especially the wooden poles, that's been a, a big part of it, our underground vaults and vault lids, as well as the transformers that are both pole mounted and, um, and pad mounted. Um, we also have two substations where the transformers and switch gear are in excess of 40 years old, so our testing program has identified that those are our priority now for us to replace. So we're working with engineering to specify uh, work up the specifications for those transformers and switch gear and then also some new circuit breakers at those substations. And in addition to that equipment, we're also looking to enhance the physical security at our substations as well. Uh, another point of emphasis uh, in 1617 will be some of the major joint projects for um, streets and water in terms of underground conversions for our electric overhead. So. Mesa Drive will be a significant effort going forward, uh, the first avenue, streetscaping, and then as we're uh, extending the, the light rail to Gilbert, we're going through the design process now of how to underground some of the overhead equipment that's in the vicinity of the Gilbert light rail extension. Uh, for 1617's uh, budget, here's some highlight points uh, for safety. We have uh, two of our supervisors that are certified utility safety professionals, so we want to maintain their training and credentials in that regard. We feel like they've really made a big difference in how our employees are working safely. Uh, we also have identified a number of pieces of equipment and vehicles that are really in need of replacement and upgrade, and so uh, we'll spend about $664,000 on a, a new trouble truck. That's the truck that our linemen roll out to when they get an emergency service call. They have a hydraulic lift to allow them to reach up to the uh, infrastructure that's in the air. And then a digger derrick, so this is the piece of equipment that drills the holes for the pole replacements or, or pole installations, as well as it serves as the boom truck to raise equipment up to the pole as the uh, linemen are working on the pole or in a, a bucket truck. And then we also have a, a mini digger derrick that we used extensively during the circuit conversion. That's a, essentially a device that allows us to do what the bigger digger derrick does, but it's for where there's a, a lot less space where we can't get the digger derrick into. And then we've, uh, in terms of reliability, we've really um, got on a very regular, frequent basis for tree trimming. And so 
Um, while our outages during storms are usually because of trees falling into lines or, or some tree limbs, but the, the tree trimming has really cut down on the number of um, outages for, due to trees as well as the duration of those trees. So tree trimming allows us to tree trim, trim the trees, but it doesn't allow us to remove the trees that may ultimately fall on a line. So that's the, the challenge there. Uh, you can see we've got about uh, three hundred thousand dollars for pole replacements, and then about two hundred thousand dollars for the um, uh, trip savers and the animal guards. For fifteen sixteen uh, gas, so our priorities again are safety, reliability, and efficiency. Um, hopefully, this time next year we'll have about a, a year and a half uh, without a lost time accident. Um, one of the things I, I like to brag about is our um, blue stake or dial before you dig eight one one program. Um, we protect 10 different pieces of the city's underground infrastructure by locating this infrastructure in a timely, accurate basis. And you can see that on the gas side, um, our number of damages per thousand locates is about one-sixth of the national average. And I think our, our um, accuracy is about that on the other pieces of infrastructure as well. Um, Scott mentioned the uh, sea and juice station, so we're uh, working closely with engineering and and uh, environmental management on the CNG station uh, will be responsible ultimately for the... Excuse me, yes, Frank. Sir. Mr. Kavanaugh has a question for you. And I should have asked this earlier, uh, where is that station going to locate? Uh, the CNG station is going to be at the 6th Street campus, um, 640 North Mesa Drive, uh, just a little bit south of uh, 8th Street. Just to uh, follow up on this, it has a public interface though, doesn't it? Um, not at this time. We're not yeah. anticipating it because the ingress and the egress to that station is just problematic. So as we were looking for, and Scott, please jump in if I, if I deviate. Um, but uh, as we were looking for the location to serve the solid waste trucks, we were really focused on making sure we could efficiently and effectively serve them. And as we were looking at locations other than 6th Street, it just wasn't feasible to move it off of the 6th Street campus. So as we are locating on the 6th Street campus, it, I'm not saying we'll never have a, a public access to it, but it just doesn't seem feasible at this stage. Okay, thanks. Um, but we're working with uh, environmental management and, and fleet uh, and uh, engineering on, on how that station is coming together. And so there'll be a RFP for uh, O&M services coming out here in the next uh, month or so, and then we'll be coming back to the council for approval of that. We've had a, a fairly healthy uh, residential and commercial growth. Nothing um, that's really stressed our resources, but um, we are having some growth on the gas side. For 1617, I mentioned the CNG station uh, and the RFP for o &M <coughs> services. Um, I'd like to focus on uh, the, the bullet about four pressure regulated stations. Um, so there's two of these stations that also have a significant amount of high pressure main and intermediate uh, pressure plastic pipe associated with them. So that's why that price tag is a little bit higher than what you would normally see. Um, but those pressure regulator stations will allow us to enhance the service to existing customers and also be able to have the capacity to serve uh, growing customers as well. For our budget highlights for 1617, um, in terms of, of safety, um, one of the things that uh, to know is that we're very heavily regulated by the state and federal regulations. So we undergo an annual audit by auditors from the Arizona Corporation Commission and their pipeline safety group. So as a part of that, we have to train our employees to a very high level. It's called operator qualification. So every three years, our employees will go through a training and certification recertification program. So one third of our employees every year is getting recertified. And we also have to certify all new employees. So we spend a significant amount of time and energy on the training. Um, in terms of reliability, uh, we have multiple uh, pressure regulator stations that have not historically been connected to the SCADA or supervisory control and data acquisition system. So this is how we remotely monitor those types of uh, devices and installations in our system. And so these enhancements will allow us to connect those regulator stations that we've previously had to manually visit in order to get that system data, they will now be connected to the SCADA system so we can remotely monitor those stations. And with the new pressure regulator stations, again, we have uh, some significant high pressure steel and intermediate pressure plastic pipe associated with two of those projects. I'll move into the uh, electric 
rate uh, recommendation. So our recommendation uh, is a, a mirror of our recent practice where we generate the additional revenue, which is about $211,000 per year, by increasing the system service charge component. That's the rate component of our bills, our rate structure that's not tied to consumption. And so we're only also proposing this for the residential customers as well. So the $1.50 increase will be about a 1.6% increase to our customers. And this is only the third proposed increase to these types of components since fiscal year 2003-2004. At this time, we're not recommending any rate adjustments for the non-residential customers. Um, there's a couple of very important um, factors that we consider when we come forward and design these recommendations. One is the customer's ability to afford the proposed increase. Um, one of the things that we accomplish by increasing this non-consumption based charge is that if we have inordinately high temperatures, higher than we would normally experience, we're a very weather sensitive uh, system. So our customer's consumption will likely increase if the temperatures get higher than normal. So by increasing this part of the component, it kind of minimizes how much of a bill spike those customers might see when we see those higher temperatures. Now, the correlation to that is also if it's a cooler than normal summer, then their bill's not gonna go down. So there's a, a correlation there. Um, the other factor that we really uh, weigh heavily is how do we compare with a comparable service from Salt River Project? So turning to the next slide, um, our proposed service charge of 950 is about $10.50 below SRP's currently mo current monthly service charge. And so the monthly bills during calendar year 2015, if we'd applied the proposed rates during 2015, would be about 8.2% less than if they were served by SRP. Now, because of the way our rate structure is different from SRP's, if you're a lower consuming customer than the average, then your advantage over a SRP bill is higher. Um, we pass our commodity costs through a, a separate make rate mechanism called the electric energy cost adjustment factor. And with the new contracts that we're expecting to execute hopefully today, uh, we mentioned this in the RFP process that was approved this Monday by the council, we're hoping that those costs will come in low enough that they'll offset, uh, if not some, all of the proposed increase. Uh, for the lower income customers, the way we want to try to minimize the impact of the $1.50 increases through our summer energy assistance program. Uh, Council Member Glover came up with the idea last uh, budget cycle to create a, a, a discount program for low income customers. So we call it the C program or summer energy assistance program. And we're kicking that off for the second year. We're proposing for the council to approve that. Um, by increasing the customer charge $1.50, it'll increase the discount for those C participants from $12.31 a month to $13.84 a month. So we'll minimize the impact on the, the lower consuming, lower income customers as a result of increasing that rate component versus the consumption based component. So we think there's a good offset there. In terms of uh, gas utility rate recommendations, again, we're following the practice that we've had the last couple of years. Uh, we expect that the rate adjustment will increase revenues by about $605,000 a year. It'll be a dollar per month on that system service charge that applies to all customers, large and small. So for the residential customer in the summertime, the increase will go from $12.11 to $13.11 per month. And in the wintertime, it'll be from $15.04 to $16.04. And again, similar to the, the philosophy that we have on the electric side, if there's a inordinately cold winter, um, then this will minimize the bill impact there. The, the bill increase won't be as large as it otherwise would be if we had, had applied the rate increase to the consumption-based charges. So the average residential customer bill will go up about 3%. And in terms of comparability with Southwest Gas, we're still uh, a small amount less than Southwest Gas with the proposed increases. And with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Council, any questions? Mr. Thompson. Frank, you have phenomenal um, 811 record. Um, <clears throat> most of your most locates, I think, for utilities uh, in the valley probably can't even touch that. Um, my question really is, is geared towards the 811 and third party damage. Are we experiencing with with the increase in growth across the valley? Are we starting to experience a lot more third party damage? And if so, are we collecting 
the full um, cost of making those repairs when we're when we're properly located. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think we've seen a, a huge increase in the amount of third party damage um, as a result of the increase in construction activity. Um, we do um, assess uh, a contractor the costs associated with our response and repair of our system in the event that they, at least on the gas side, I'm not sure what they do on the other sides or the, I, I'm sure of that on the gas and electric side, I'm not sure about the other pieces of infrastructure, but we, we definitely send them an invoice and then uh, our risk management department follows up with them to try and recover that. So I don't know actually what the recovery rate is. I'd have to, to check into that for you. Um, thank you, great report. Uh, I've noticed lately a lot of City of Mesa meter readers out walking around, and so it just prompted the question. I, I, I know there's digital meters, and I'm curious to know how many meters do we have, how many are, are digitally read, how many are manually read, and I'm sorry to, to spring that on you, but I did, round, rough numbers would be good. No, that's okay. I think I'm going to defer to my friends in the Water Resources Department who actually manage the meter reading. Oh, tasks. okay. So, the, the, well, there's electric meters and water meters, right? There's electric meters and gas meters. And gas meters. We did meters. A, a pilot several years ago where we converted the manually read meters to kind of a drive-by or walk-by meter reading program, and right. I think there was a couple of hundred meters at least in there. Oh, so the same meter that. reader is looking at the electric meter and at the gas meter? And the water meter, yes. And the water meter, yes. okay. Mayor, we have uh, currently about 230,000 meters we read, and we have about 3,500 uh, 3, equipped for automatic reading at this point. Um, as Frank mentioned, we're looking at a, a, an RFP. We're working jointly with Energy to see uh, if that's going to pay out for MESA. So we'll be uh, evaluating the, um, that technology to see how we want to move forward. We know right now it's um, probably cheaper for us to add more meter readers at this state because they uh, each read 10,000 meters per month, which is um, um, and, and a very, very high um, accuracy rate as well. So uh, we do a really good job with our meter readers. Okay. That's good. So, so we're comfortable that... Uh, that 20th century technology of somebody walking around is, at, at least for now, is the most cost-effective cost way of doing it. There are some additional advantages, and maybe Frank can go into that. Um, some of your troubleshooting and some of your uh, things you can see in your system that a, a human wouldn't pick up necessarily. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, there are non-cost advantages associated with some kind of uh, advanced metering technology. Um, there's technology where you can remotely turn off and turn on an electric customer so a technician or, or a service specialist does not have to visit the home and flip the switch. You can do that remotely. Um, but there's been a lot of lessons learned from smart grid and smart meter that uh, uh, I, I'm glad we've held back and, and we didn't have to learn those lessons and the unintended consequences the hard way. In talking to my peers, uh, they, they get a lot of problems. They spend a lot of time dealing with the customer complaints and the anxieties that customers have about smart meters and uh, all the associated public health impacts and privacy issues. And so we've been very reluctant to go forward fast, um, but working with uh, water, we think now is the right time to take a look at it. You know, when you can read three meters at once, gas, gas electric, and water, uh, your meter reading costs are going to go down. So where we've implemented the um, automated metering, meter reading approach is, say, out in Magma, where we're only reading one gas meter, or in a part <laughs> of Mesa where we're only reading one water meter, or the distance between residences for a gas and water meter is very long, such as Las Cindas. So um, I think we've gone about it the prudent approach. I think it's time to uh, look at it again uh, in a more holistic approach, not just how much do we save or spend on meter reading, but what are these other ancillary benefits, such as customers being able to dial up and see what their energy consumption is in a given point in time? Um, or I, did I leave my thermostat up too high, and so now my bill's going to be high when I get home, so maybe I can do something to uh, adjust my thermostat? Okay, well, I'll be interested to see. How you, it sounds like we're where we ought to be right now. Mr. Thompson? And Frank, I love the concept of smart meters, but I think they also have the draw. The, the, I think the drawback, from my perspective, is that the human element um, can see problems, like Dan said, with the system. So whether it's corrosion, 
uh, or whatever you see, you can still document that, get that turned in, and get the repairs made. Uh, magma, a whole different animal because we only have the gas down there. Um, we spend, a, a, you know, it's, you know, it's a half a day to get to magma, I think, sometimes, depending on which route you take. And so, you know, it, it, in those applications, it might be smarter to use the smart meter uh, concept. But, but certainly, I, I would, um, I would still, I still like that human touch because they do see the issues out there, whether it's somebody trying to bypass a meter or which happens quite frequently in the valley with both gas and the electric side. Yeah. And, uh, and or uh, any corrosion issues that are out there. So, Pre Appreciate those comments. That's definitely one of the things that we're gonna factor into our, our considerations is um, by that monthly visit to that residence or that business, what are the uh, ad adverse operating conditions that we would be able to identify that if we went to a full electronic remote approach, we wouldn't have that interaction or that visit. Thank you. And those are still, um, per the feds and per, per ACC, those are those unsatisfactory operating conditions are still reportable, right? And you have a certain amount of days to correct any of those actions? It, it, it depends upon the level of severity of what that adverse operating condition is. It, it's what triggers whether or not we report that to the ACC or to the feds. It, had, it has to be a fairly significant event for it to become a reportable incident. Uh, best part of the presentation, I thought, was the fact that we are less than SRP. We're less than Southwest Gas. That's a great story to tell. We talk about the importance of the Enterprise Fund for the City of Mesa's budget, and I think that creates this, this uh, inherent uh, suspicion that we are gouging our utility customers in order, you know, we're, that we're balancing the, the city's books on the back of our utility customers. So. The more we can tell stories like this where, hey, you're at a competitive advantage if you're a City of Mesa customer when it comes to some of these utilities because we are the City of Mesa. We're, your best interests are, are, our, are our agenda. And it, it's less clear when we get into water because water is so expensive. And so I'm, I'm, I'd love to see us uh, continue to tell this story you know, in, in, the, in the electric and gas situation that – uh, you're, you're lucky if you're one of our customers because uh, we're less expensive. But uh, water is the one that I think is, uh, I'm trying to figure out how we're going to tell that story. So, <laughs> thank you. Here, here we're going to teen up water now. Note. Yes. <laughs> nice transition. On that note, and, and here is Seth Weld to answer those questions. Yes. Um, as, we go, as we go over the Water Resources Department, which is both our water and wastewater utilities. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll touch on some of our fiscal year 15, 16 accomplishments first. Um, we did complete an upgrade to our field force automation or mobile dispatch system. What this system is, it is an automated system where customer services enters a service order and our customer service field operations group gets it electronically. It prioritizes it, it helps route them. Uh, this upgrade was completed using in-house staff and we actually achieved a savings in excess of $100,000 by doing it that way. Um, as Beth touched on, one of our major projects is our Valvista transmission main. The phase one segment was actually done a year ago, and during fiscal year 15-16, we completed the warranty inspection of that segment, and no issues were noted. And again, as Beth touched on, phase two was completed this year, and phase three is certainly well underway, and phase three is the final phase of this project. <coughs> uh, during 15-16, we've been addressing some reliability improvements. Um, at our Brown Road water treatment plant, we have been addressing failures of our underdrain filter system. Um, as I speak today, we currently have two out of service today with one soon to be back online. Um, these are critical components within the operation of this plant because each loss of filter results in a reduction of 4 million gallons per day in production. So as we go into the summertime, that's critical for us. Uh, we have installed backup generators at some of our key pump station loca locations in Northeast Mesa. Uh, so that in the event of any power outage, we can still provide service in those upper regions where we have to actually pump the water. Um, and we've drilled new wells primarily in Southeast Mesa, again, to improve our reliability and provide redundancy in our water system. Uh, the good news story in fiscal year 15-16, we are projecting a savings of about $3 million on our budget. Uh, that has been primarily achieved in our 91st Wastewater Avenue plant, where we are a partner with four other cities our Valvista water treatment plant, where we are a partner with one other city, and in our energy and chemical usage. 
Our 16, 17 areas of emphasis uh, will continue to be our Southeast Mesa infrastructure. Again, Beth touched on these earlier. The, the construction of the Signal Butte water treatment plant will begin this summer and is scheduled to be completed in May 2018. And we will continue with the design of the Greenfield Water Reclamation Plant expansion with that construction beginning early 2018 with completion in the fall of 2020. Uh, we will continue with the uh, aging or water line infrastructure replacements to continue to address reliability. Um, we're going to continue or we're going to kick off our succession planning. We are faced with a significant number of employees who are eligible to retire over the next two years and we want to continue to reload and be prepared for the future. Uh, additionally, we will begin the recruitment process for the staffing at the Signal B water treatment plant. Um, we have some challenges for positions like that. There are other cities in the valley who are also recruiting for similar positions and we're all competing for the same talent pool. So we need to begin that process early in hopes that we can get the best of the best. Our 1617 budget highlights, good news story. We actually have a decrease in our water commodity purchase uh, for 1617. However, based on the rate projections that our suppliers have furnished to us, we are faced with a potential $3 million increase over the following four years. Um, we do have increases in chemicals and energy, primarily through the increased usage, not necessarily in our unit pricing. And our joint venture costs are also increasing. Again, our partners are also experiencing pressures in their costs. And unfortunately, in those situations where a partner, we have to share in those costs. I apologize um, for interrupting you, but I can't, can we go back to the projected $3 million increase over the next four years? Mm -hmm. Why is that? It's projected rate increases from our suppliers. Um, our suppliers being Salt River Project and CAP? Primarily CAP. Okay. That, is, that is the bigger of our two suppliers. So um, why, are, why are those rates going up? It, uh, CAP is, uh, I think, trying to increase their um, capital uh, fund, their available capital fund for improvements on their canal system. And unfortunately, they pass those costs through to the, the municipal end users. Um, this isn't necessarily due to an increase in our water commodity order. It is strictly driven by the rate increases. Um, I do believe CAP is actually making the rounds and trying to visit with the various municipalities and mayors and council members. Yeah. Um, so I think they'll be reaching out to you. Oh, they have. Yeah, I, I had a meeting with them. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, our 1617 budget highlight, we, are, we will begin the recruitment process for our Signal Butte water treatment plants. And for our rates, we'd like to continue with year two of our five-year residential tier realignment plan, which was approved last year. The water rate structure has two components. We have a service charge, which is a flat monthly rate based on the meter size. And then we have a usage charge, which is based on the units of water consumption rounded to 1,000 gallon increments. Over the last few years, we focused on better aligning our fixed revenues with our fixed costs. And we have a goal of between 35 and 40% for our fixed revenues. Uh, for fiscal year 1617, we should be at 36.1%. This is important because this minimizes the city's risk in the event that consumption takes a radical decline, which we have seen in the last few years. Um, we will continue to be challenged with a decline in the consumption per residential account. So, and in 1516, we implemented a fourth residential usage tier to better align our usage tiers with the usage patterns and associated costs. And so for fiscal year 1617, this would be the second year of that five-year plan. By implementing it over five years, it allows our customers to evaluate their actual usage and if they can implement any conservation to help minimize the impact to them, it gives them that time to make that adjustment. The next slide, uh, this- uh, I, I apologize again for uh, interrupting you. That's button. fine. So water consumption per customer is going down. Correct. But we're just getting more customers. Correct. Okay. Correct. The system is growing, and unfortunately, with the new development that's coming in, it's it's high density, smaller lot sizes, small smaller homes, um, zero scapes. So their water usage on the new homes is is generally down at the very low end. Mr. Thompson, and, and also the appliances are becoming more more efficient Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it, it's it's good to note too that that water, even though the water consumption is declining, that also inadversely impacts our wastewater treatment plants as well. Correct. You don't get the flow rates. Correct. Uh, again, this slide, the top half shows what the current residential tier structure is today. And the bottom half is what we're recommending for fiscal year 16, 17. This is consistent with the year two portion of that five-year plan that we presented a year ago. 
this I'm, light? I'm, again, I apologize. <clears throat> uh, the average customer, mm -hmm. uh, where do they fall on the, uh, if, is there such a thing as an average customer? Typically, we use 9,000 gallons is typically the calculation we use. Um, I, again, your summer usage is going to push up a little higher. That's where your higher demand is, whereas in your wintertime, your usage may go down. But it seems to be kind of around a 9,000 gallon average. So someone who lives in like a multifamily uh, situation or in a small single family home, they're probably in the neighborhood of like a 9,000 gallon customer. Depending on number of, of residents in the home, they could be less. We've actually seen, again, the newer developments coming on. They're actually closer to the 5,000 gallon mark. Okay. So a larger, a larger family, you know, a few kids, a bigger house, bigger lot, probably sprinklers on the grass, maybe even a swimming pool. What, how many gallons a month is that type of a user using? Uh, they would probably be closer to that 9,000, 10,000 range. Okay, thank you. Again, this is the same slide we showed you a year ago, which uh, uh, illustrates um, the four different tiers in the implementation over the five-year uh, period. Year one represents fiscal year 15, 16, so as you move to the right, those are your future years. This also is a slide that we showed you a year ago. This illustrates um, the, the residential capacity of our water distribution system and the actual demand on the system. Unfortunately, we have to design and build our distribution system to meet those peak demands. So what you see illustrated in the red shading is available capacity that is unused during those off-peak times. And unfortunately, you'll see that that high demand in the summertime, we must have that capacity to meet that demand. Each of those different colors also illustrates our typical four usage patterns that we're seeing in the city. So th this is capacity prior to our new water treatment plant? Uh, the water treatment plant won't have an impact on the distribution system. That's the ability oh. to produce the water. This is in the distribution system itself. The ability to deliver the water. Correct. So for fiscal year 16-17, we are recommending a 5% increase on all rate components. Uh, this will result in the uh, service charge increasing to $26.62 per month. And based on that average consumption of roughly 9,000 gallons that we talked about, including some uh, additional usage perhaps in Tier 2 in the summer, that would take a total bill to an average of $47.26 per month. Um, we also recommend lowering the eligibility for the commercial and industrial large water service rate from 8,500 kgals per month to 6,000 kgals per month. We're hopeful that this might be a, a tool that our economic development folks might be able to help utilize to help attract large customers to the city of Mesa. And additionally to that, we are uh, creating some site, uh, sustainability criteria that we would require those customers to present and meet to continue to be eligible to be on this rate. What's a K gallon? Thousand gallons. <laughs> so that, that would represent so a customer. 6,000, thousand gallons? Are you talking about a six million gallons? Okay. Very high user. Uh, today we have no customers that reach either one of those two thresholds. As a city, we used to have a customer a little over a year ago that did fall at that 8,500 K gallon threshold, but they are no longer here today in that type of a situation or that type of an operation. So on our wastewater side, this is also comprised of two components, a service charge, which is a flat monthly rate, and a user charge based on demand volume. The volume is actually calculated annually for the typical customer based on 90% of the average monthly water use for the three lowest months from December through March. This approximates uh, average indoor household usage, and that resulting calculation is the, the volume charge that the customer will see on their billing statement for the next 12 months. And so for 1617, a 5% increase will result in the service charge increasing to $18.08 .08 per month and a total bill of $26.01 per month. So that concludes what I have. I'm available for questions. Otherwise, Candace will take over, I believe. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Council, any questions regarding this presentation? Uh, the thing you said that resonates with me is we need to go out and recruit more large customers. I mean, if, if this, if, as an enterprise, if we're going to operate utilities as an enterprise, uh, and I think we're in a unique situation, particularly when it comes to the electric utility, and that we're not subject to the Corporation Commission regulation, and that makes us attractive to a lot of users. I'm not, I don't fully understand why, but I, I know rate increases and and dealing with rates at the Corporation Commission are very complicated uh, process and so people would love to avoid that if they can 
So I think we have some things to sell uh, as, as a utility provider to these large commercial uh, users. And I know I, I'm preaching to the choir. I mean, this, this, I've learned that from you people, but, but I agree we need to go out and, and, uh, and balance our, our, our budget on the backs of large uh, corporate uh, providers rather than on our, our small uh, residential customers. So th this will be an interesting debate. I'm sure I, I, I'm not 100% sold yet on the 5% increase for water. Uh, so we'll, we'll struggle with that. But thank you. Great presentation. Is there anything left for your presentation, Candace? We are going to sum it all up for you. Okay, thank you. So when we put all these together, one of the things that we want to look at, obviously, is, is that impact on our um, median household within the city of Mesa. And they've all kind of told you what those impacts are. So on this slide here, what we're doing is kind of pulling that all together. One of the things that we look at, um, electric and natural gas are kind of below the line because we don't do a comparison with other municipalities because they don't offer those same services. We compare out with SRP and with Southwest Gas. Then we look at solid waste water and wastewater. One of the things that we really use is that homeowner's comparison. It is one of the items that is attached to this particular item in Legistar. So there is an attachment out there um, that would be the homeowner comparison. And what that does is that takes what the effect is on that median household, whether it's a median household value based on property tax or their usage based on consumption, the solid waste rates and so forth, and puts that all together to give us a comparison across municipalities. When we look at that, where we sit today is Mesa is currently the fourth lowest in our comparison pool. Um, if we were to um, go forward with the recommendations for the 1617 rates, if the other cities did not change any of their rates, it would just move us a couple of dollars to being the fifth largest. Um, we're right close with uh, Phoenix. If you look at the graph between uh, ourselves and Phoenix, we're right neck and neck on that one. That is one of the items that we look at because, because we don't have a primary property tax, we want to make sure that we're looking at the total impact to the residents in all services from the city. We kind of come full circle at the beginning. We talked about what our revenue targets were, um, what we had asked the departments to look at to see how we could um, implement those particular targets. What's being presented to you today for the 1617 recommended budgets do achieve the targets um, as outlined at the beginning of the presentation. Again, we also talked about forecasting, and we really don't want to forecast for one fiscal year. We want to forecast for multiple fiscal years because we want to make sure that we can maintain our 8 to 10 percent minimum reserve balance over the course of the fiscal year so we don't have rate spikes in any one particular year. And so we take a look at this slide here. You can see that the top line is our um, reserve balances. Those are our projected reserve balances. The reason why in 1516, these are different from the ones that we came when we went to the Audit Finance and Enterprise Committee because during that time we refunded some of our existing bonds and we came to you a couple times and talked to you about the savings that we were actually able to achieve. A lot of those savings we actually took up front in our 1516 fiscal year. So in our current fiscal year, debt service that was scheduled to be paid this fiscal year, we do not have to pay as much. We had savings actually in this fiscal year. And so you see in our 1516 estimate, we're actually going, I think we're going to end with about a 16.5% fund balance. The bulk of that, about $9 million of that, is due to those refundings that we did. So that was not information that we knew during audit and finance. What that did is it actually took some of that pressure off some of those out years. If you recall, we also came back and talked about well, we, how we had a debt service bump, if you will that was going out toward the 18-19 fiscal year, kind of 17-18, 18-19. Well, those refundings actually took a little bit of that pressure off of that bump and actually gave us reserves. So when we went to audit and finance, we had anticipated a 5% increase for each year of the forecast year for water. So that would have been a 5% across the board on this particular slide. Because of that refunding and that release of that expenditure pressure, we're able to bring those down to the 4.5 to get us through that bump in debt service, which is still there, but it is smaller. And then actually, by the time we get to 2021 and past that bump, we've kind of leveled out back down to the 4%. And that's where we anticipate going forward is kind of getting over that bump and then coming back down and be on, on a good track after that with level, with le level debt service. Of course, in the future, we'll continue to look for possible refunding opportunities that would help us with our existing debt. We'll always be constantly looking for that. Anytime that we can take advantage of that, this is the type of effect 
that those refundings can have on our projected rate increases. So we've looked at this, the dollar fifties and the dollars at the top, those are the electric and gas, that's assuming the same type of implementation um, on that fixed charge. And then the bottom is the percentages, and those would be on the consumption charges. If you take that and look at the numbers, what are the numbers behind that? Those are the rates and those are the percentages. If you take a look behind for the numbers, you can see uh, the beginning reserve balances, but you can see kind of in the middle there are total sources, those are our revenues, and then our total uses or our expenditures. And so when we look at that, um, that's what we're trying to look at. So the uses are expenditures, that's our forecast. Uh, when we come in and look at our rates and our projected rates into the future, that's where we're going in and trying to make sure that our sources are appropriate for the uses that we've projected going into the future. And then that kind of wraps it up. So any questions on those? Those are our proposed um, rates for the utilities for <laughs> fiscal year 1617. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much. Council, any questions at this point? Uh, congratulations again on this, this great uh, bond refinancing event that occurred uh, a couple of weeks ago. Can you, uh, I know we've talked about it, but can you give us just another short paragraph on what happened and how much we saved? I'm actually going to ask Mike Kennington um, to come up and give, um, he knows the, the details okay. on each year. Mayor, council members, uh, Mike Kennington, the chief financial officer. Like you said, it was a, a great day in the market when we went out several weeks ago. We had come to the council and, and estimated the savings would be about three and a half million dollars for our utility, our enterprise funds, our utility revenue funds, funds, and uh, we we plan on getting about a, a one point. I think it was six or seven million dollars of savings estimated for the general obligation bonds. The day we went to market, it was the day that there was the catastrophe in Brussels, the, the terrorist attack. And so it created a flight to quality. When there's more demand for the bonds for, the, for these type of fixed income securities, it lowers the, um, it increases the price and lowers the rates. So we were able to get $10 million of, um, well, approximately uh, $13 million of savings overall, present value. That's over time. So that's the savings we had in the inter, uh, utility revenue bonds and about $2.5 million of savings today estimated over time for the general obligation bonds. So we far exceeded our estimate um, that we had initially proposed. So it was a really good day to go to the market, unfortunately for the, the tragic events in Brussels, but good for bond uh, issuers. Okay. Well, great. Uh, quick, quick question I have. I, I know we're in the midst of building probably the biggest thing we've ever built as a city, this, uh, this uh, Signal Butte water treatment plant. Uh, and so that's going to require the issuance of a lot of debt. That is, uh, I, I can use that to explain to people why our, our water rates are have to increase to address the growth in that part of town. Of course, it, it, it seems like part of that story is once the customers fill in in that part of the city, we'll be able to, to spread that cost out over more people and the, the, the pressure on water rates will subside. Is that generally that, that's true? That's correct, Bear. When we do the forecast, we are forecasting additional accounts, but we are not forecasting an additional very high water usage customer to come in. Um, we don't anticipate those types of things in our forecast. We want to make sure that we're conservative, that if we don't have one and the timing and so forth. So if we were to um, acquire high water usage customers out in that area or any area in the city of Mesa, that would obviously offset the pressure on the existing customers. Great. All right, yes, Mr. Thompson, there's a challenge for you at Elliott Road. We need some high water use uh, yeah, customers. Well, I'm working on that nonstop. Um, you know, probably more of a statement than a question, but yesterday uh, Dan and uh, myself uh, and Brian met with um, the director of EMWA. And, um, you know, the, the question I think that, we, that needs to be asked of CAP at some point in time is, are they capable of refinancing their debt like we write, refinance our debt to maybe get the rates lower because that three million over over a four year period increase seems like if they were able to refinance their debt and and I don't know the intricacies of being the the, the quasi governmental or however they're funded, but if there's an opportunity there for them to have some savings by refinancing debt, hopefully they could pass that along to their customers as well. Thank you. We will uh, we do talk to them and we'll ask those questions. Thank you very much. Great presentation. So this is in context will come. Well, I'm sorry. Here's the, the last question I need to ask is that I've been asking okay. everyone is uh, what are the important metrics in your departments? If we were to have a, a council dashboard that, that kept track of uh, the measurable uh, outcomes in your departments, 
what, what, what are you looking at and, and what should we be more aware of? For energy, it, it, it's the safety, reliability, and efficiency. So for safety uh, perspective, it, it's number of days without a lost time exit for our employees. Um, and then uh, for reliability, it's uh, our average response times for, so we, we, we have a target of no more than 30 minutes of response to an emergency call out or a service interruption. And so we also measure what percentage of calls exceed 30 minutes. And so we have a cap on that. So anytime our response exceeds 30 minutes, we do a thorough review, identifying what causes that type of issue to occur. Uh, the other metric is the bill comparison. So right now we're, we're comparing very favorably for residential customers uh, with SRP and Southwest Gas. Those are our primary benchmarks for us. Great, thank you. Um, I, I'd say with us, we, we have a, kind of a diverse department. So there's a couple of different metrics. Um, it, with the sustainability side, we're really looking at kilowatt hours, both generated from a solar perspective, uh, and then um, savings that we create through our energy conservation programs. And all of those can get correlated back to dollars. Um, from the solid waste perspective, I think on our, our commercial side, what we're really focusing on is growing that business. So we've put in a new metric where we're looking at uh, the number of customers that we have and growing that commercial business that we have. Um, and then from the, the, the residential side, we are also trying to focus, and it, it hits on some of the stuff we talked about with composting even, is what can we do with our diversion rates and, and getting more things out of that black barrel uh, and turning things that are now considered a waste into a resource. That's great. Candace, you, you're the one that's collecting all this information, right? And you're going to come back to us with, with some of these metrics on a proposed dashboard, perhaps? Um, yes, sir. Um, we are collecting, we're, we're jotting all this down. Most of this is information that they already have. Yeah. Um, we already do internal, what we call Mesa stat meetings. Right. And so a lot of the departments are collecting this information and have already been tracking it. Sometimes if they're not collecting it, if they're collecting it just within their department, then we'll be working with them to try to get on a more of a public format. Right. Um, and then we'll be coming back um, to the- Both of those were, I'm anxious to, to see those, those metrics in the future as well. But. What about water? What, what would you say? Uh, our side, the focus is going to be on the reliability of the system. We need to be able to deliver when the demand is there, uh, reliably uh, minimal service disruptions, the ability to collect the wastewater and take it away. Uh, obviously, we want to prevent any uh, sanitary sewer overflows. Uh, that becomes a health uh, issue for the public. Um, additionally, a second area is going to be our water quality. Uh, we do have to monitor that very closely because a, a, that water quality can change very rapidly and that can become a significant impact on the cost of our operation to treat uh, degrading water quality. Speaking of water quality, given uh, the national attention on water quality, the, you know, there's always rumors circulating uh, about the level, our, our water quality, what, what can you do to reassure or, or scare our, uh, our customers? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to try to avoid scaring them. Um, the good news is our, our consumer confidence report is uh, currently under development right now. The 2015 edition should be released in the next uh, 30 to 60 days. Uh, we have released various different publications and communications out there to reassure the public that you know, we do not have lead pipes in our distribution system. Um, is there lead potentially in the water? There could be small traces through our water source, but we're fortunate in this part of the country that that is minimal. Um, but the challenge with lead within the water, which obviously seems to be the big topic, is lead pipes in the older homes. That's beyond our distribution system. Uh, some of the older homes, when the uh, copper piping was soldered, the solder was used with lead-based copper. That, over time, begins to be saturate into the pipe and then gets into the water. Um, so from a water quality standpoint, rest assured, you know, we're, we're one of the best out there. And Mayor, if I could add one thing, uh, City Mesa has been required to do lead and copper testing every three years in homes. I think we've been doing that since 1991 uh, with no exceedances at all. And uh, like Seth, Seth mentioned, we don't have any lead pipes that would cause that in the system. Uh, typically, if there is some lead, it's usually in the uh, infrastructure within the homes. So it's something we look at. And the, in the, in the homes that are looked at are those that are aging homes that might have had something like that. So we've had no exceedances. So uh, that's something you can find in our consumer <laughs> confidence report. And I'll put in a plug for Mr. Brady's uh, most recent Mesa Now seg segment. And that was um, on water quality. And he talked to a number of folks. And I may or may not be in there as well. But uh, <laughs> we talked about the, the assuring our customers that uh, Mesa does provide outstanding water and safe, reliable water.
Thank you very much. Council, any additional questions for these folks? Thank you very much. Good presentation. So, Mayor, these will be coming back to you in May for um, introduction, and then uh, the introduction of the ordinances would be in May, and then adoption would be uh, May 16th. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sure this will, uh, will be discussed at uh, kind of a budget summary prior to then as well. Next item on our agenda is information pertaining to the current job order contracting projects. Councils, any <coughs> questions or concerns about that item? Seeing none. The next is to acknowledge receipts of minutes. I will entertain a motion. Thank second. you. In a second, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. That passes. Next is to hear reports on meetings or conferences attended. Mr. Cavanaugh. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, Mr. Thompson and I attended uh, a very major event in our community yesterday, the opening of the uh, Arizona International Market at uh, Dobson and Broadway. It's the site of the old uh, Super Kmart Center. And Mr. Thompson will verify that uh, thousands of people were there and the uh, media response has been incredible. Social media has been uh, incredible. Uh, apparently the entire West Valley is jealous of Mesa right now and saying they're gonna have to drive here to shop. And uh, I want the reason I wanted to highlight that is it, it's, uh, it's a really great success story. Uh, the owners of Mekong Plaza uh, took a big risk in opening Mekong Plaza in 2008. And uh, that has really become the kind of the Vietnamese cultural capital of Arizona, and they have expanded to uh, buy the entire plaza where uh, uh, Kmart was, and it's uh, uh, this is a hundred thousand square foot uh, uh, international market that, and with, with all the associated buildings, many new restaurants and shops, it's fully leased, and um, this is really uh, a great story of redevelopment in West Mesa because, really, right right in this month, uh, we're, in the last. Uh, 30 days, next 30 days, we're seeing the culmination of really three very important uh, factors or uh, things that are happening there with the opening of the international market. Ms. Huning and her staff did a great job overseeing the streetscape uh, improvement on uh, Dobson between Maine and Broadway. That's That was a grant-funded project that has dramatically uh, changed the appearance of, uh, of that area, leading from Sycamore Station on down. On the, uh, on the west side of Dobson, we've seen the completion of really what was the old Motorola business site with uh, two new, uh, very large uh, buildings in the cities in very uh, uh, intense discussions with a, uh, uh, a company to bring uh, hundreds of manufacturing jobs to that site, hoping to bring a, a development agreement in the next month. So these are, this is really uh, transformed into both a job area a new retail area for revenue into the city and uh, really uh, places that will bring visitors into the community to, to shop. We, we saw the phenomenon when light rail opened, people were riding the rail uh, from all over the valley to come shop at Mekong Plaza. And I think you're gonna see the extension of that phenomenon. Uh, we recently, when we implemented bike share, we worked on making sure that we were gonna have uh, bike stations in these areas close to this, this retail and the new jobs there and so it is really a, a great story for for both the public and private sector coming together to revitalize this area in terms of, of new and quality jobs and and new retail that is a that is a destination center for the city so i wanted to uh, commend the city staff who worked on this the owners of uh, international market again could not be could not have given greater praise to work by the city staff to to uh, make it all happen so uh uh, kudos and congratulations to everybody involved. Thank you. I felt bad that I missed that event. I was out of town. Uh, this is a, a big day for me. It's a horrible day for my wife. What this means is that there'll now be multiple jars of kimchi in my refrigerator. Uh, so congratulations, and I'm looking forward to, to being there. Uh, the reason I was out of town, as long as we're, we're reporting on conferences, I've been, I spent the last uh, couple of days at a uh, What Works Cities conference. Uh, and I'm proud to report that the Mesa is a big deal uh, on the national stage on the, the What Works Cities program. Just to remind us of what we already know, Mesa was one of the first eight cities to be accepted into this program. It's a nearly $60 million grant from Bloomberg Philanthropies to help us uh, become better at uh, measurable outcomes and focusing, uh, being more data-oriented in, in the way that we operate as an as a, as a organization. Um, Mesa was actually the, the first city to complete the process, and so we've been highlighted these last few days at this national conference as what happened in Mesa. So really the whole country has been coming and, and, and uh, analyzing 
uh, and Neil and uh, Alex and uh, Mr. Brady have done a great job of telling that story. I've tried, I tried to pitch in as well. So I think you'll see more emphasis and more attention placed on Mesa. A lot of people are going to come here asking us about our participation in this program. Um, and I think it's been great and it's been a, a, a real blessing to our community to be selected to be one of these communities. Uh, so that was, that was great. Any other uh, conferences or agenda items to talk about, Council? If not, the last item on our agenda is scheduling of meetings and general, general information. Mr. Pombier. Mayor and Council, our next meeting is next Thursday at 7.30 in the morning for a study session followed by a public safety meeting at 8 a.m. And then, as was noted on Monday night, um, this week in District 6, we have a unique first-time um, Building Stronger Neighborhoods event with the Homeowners Association hosted by Councilmember Thompson. That is, let me see, April 23rd from 9 to 10.30 at Augusta Ranch Park. Right. And we look forward to a lot of people attending that. Thank you very much. Council, if there's no other issues to be brought forward, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>